Hi everybody. <clears throat> Hi everybody and welcome to the next episode of the Biodiversity Podcast by Teasels. And today I'm joined by two very special guests, uh, Jude Rice and Claire Loder from Blooming Whiteway. Hi guys, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. Excellent, oh, yeah. excellent. Uh, guys, so before we sort of get into the uh, the meat of the podcast, do you guys want to introduce yourself and yeah, tell us a little bit about yourselves individually and yeah, just how you came to be part of and founder founder members or starter members of Blooming Whiteway. Can we go first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm an artist, um, lived in Bath for 30 years, uh, teach at the university. Uh, I've worked with clay um, all my life, but I'm the, uh, my parents are horticulturalists from your neck of the woods, from East Anglia, from Cambridgeshire. Excellent. And I guess that's what kind of in my blood and in my history, my family history. Um, I've done a, some sort of horticultural training. Been waiting to get a garden for a long time. Finally got a, you know, a nice sized garden about seven years ago with my family and just started really thinking about what that space did. Uh, I guess at the same time, thinking about the, the biodiversity cli uh, crisis and the climate crisis and what gardeners can do and questioning my arts practice. I mean, there's so much to un kind of unpick here, but thinking about the role of creativity and what I could do as an individual and kind of questioning that. Um, do you want to say about you before we say like how <laughs> we came together? All right. uh, yeah, so I am a grower um, of ornamental things and food things and wild plants. Um, I'm working at Bath City Farm at the minute and work in some private gardens. Um, I, I guess I grew up around parents who were interested in growing and didn't do put my hands in the soil, I guess, for many years. And then moved to Bath for uni, stuck around, met my partner. Um, and yeah, we've kind of, bought a house with a garden that was covered in paving slabs and how disgusting um, yeah concrete <laughs> decking just big gray rectangles um so we kind of was kind of in between jobs and watching you know kind of longing for life in the garden I guess mm -hmm. and started oh, yeah. unpicking yeah unpicking it like Claire's doing in her front garden but unpicking all the hard stuff and releasing the soil and feeding it and getting stuff in it um yeah and just kind of had time to notice what arrived on plants what ate things or what didn't get visited mm. and then somewhere in there we met at mm. our city farm where I was sort of running a preschool group and then I guess we got talking yeah we? so my son at that time was about three years old and so we kind of got talking at this, this group and I kind of don't really remember how it worked out but essentially when he started school we were in the greenhouse. It was the greenhouse. Oh yeah, the greenhouse exchange. Yeah, she yeah. had a greenhouse <laughs> that she was getting rid of, and I had a bread oven. Oh yeah, wanted, yeah. Oh, so okay. we carried the greenhouse frame down the road, and I don't think yeah. I ever ended up with a bread oven. But <laughs> started with it. So I live on the estate. So I live on, on Whiteway, which is an estate, um, kind of post-war estate on, on the kind of edge of Bath. And Jude lives down the road. So we're not too far away from each other. It's quite, you know, quite, quite different spaces. And when my son went to school, I thought, I've got I've got a little bit more time. Mm. I'm really wonder whether I could set up a front garden festival. So I started doing lots of research and Jude got drawn into that. Um, and I just kind of so I know, you know, I know how the art scene in Bath works. I understand the networks and yeah. who who operates in the city and all of that. So I just kind of transposed that networking and that structure onto the kind of green spaces and the growing the people who were involved in that I just went looking for people who grew so I could talk to them and find out who they were and what they did and and sort of just clocked the people who were welcoming and the people who mm. went no oh, come back when you grow flowers or whatever yeah um, some good, good names now good friends aren't yeah they? yeah people who have claimed sort of council owned spaces and grown food in community groups and yeah yeah so it's just going out and about and and I think that's been a really big thread throughout our our approach. I mean, Jude, you know, you did photography. We kind of have this creativity that we wrote into the constitution. So Blooming White Way is, you know, it's a growing project, but we wrote in cre creativity because we believe in the power of stories. And we've modeled it on arts practice. And I'm really interested in how a creative arts practice 
um, overlaps with horticultural practice and that idea of the critical eye and, and attuning to an ecological space and how artists can tell stories and actually describe complexities. Other people could go on. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, this is absolute bloody music to my ears because <laughs> the one thing that's been going through the last few podcasts and it seems, a, you know, it's not, it's not planned, but it's like a common theme that, 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 that art and stories mm -hmm. is the is the unlock for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because i think as much as we can say about the biodiversity crisis and you know 97 percent of all wildflowers wildflower meadows have been lost and 48 mm percent -hmm. of all invertebrate life is dying or blah 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 how do we get through to people how do we, you know, we think about this stuff all the time, but how can we get that message out there? How can we engage with as many people as possible? And art and story mm. is the, well, it's through the heart, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's about feeling and it's about specificity of place as well. I just to, to say, because one of the early projects that we did, um, so, I have, so so we set up a front garden festival. Basically, we set up a front garden festival and we got about yes. 30 people who joined in in the first in the first round. But alongside that, I guess what we, we feel is more important in a way. But can we stick on that for a little bit before you move on? But it's the front yeah. garden. I'm curious because. The front garden, why did I perhaps it's just something you came to without even thinking, but why front gardens? Because. Okay. Yeah, go yeah. On. So oh, because so white way we've got this kind of map behind us um is um the majority of the houses here have a front garden space so it's okay. big it's, it's not big. just it's yeah. not like your usual you walk you it's know three terrace. steps and you're at your front door it's yeah. kind of 10 meters yeah and some people's or... front gardens are like their back gardens so they're wow. really generous mm. front gardens and i i was looking out on ours thinking well ours is block paving that's a nightmare we want to you know we we basically want to take the you know when we bought the house our parents were very happy that we could park six cars and we're like well we don't you know we just want to take the want... park six cars well that's a large like, goal isn't it well done good. parking's good the parking's good brilliant um <laughs> sorry dad mum um but we you know john and i were much more interested in in and what we could do with that space and so i looked around and thought well everybody's got this space and then i started to think that that garden connects to that garden and then i started to think and when you're in your garden you talk to people and then i spoke to um a guy like because my dad's in horticulture i spoke to somebody um uh, one of his friends and we were talking about town planning and this idea of the private defensible space i think i've got that right that idea but that's you know in in town planning lingo i guess that's the, the, the thing about you know this is my space it's my this is my kind of this is my bat and you you can't you're not allowed it and actually in the this 60s, is my bit of england to defend you know that's the, yeah, the famous actually, jury line sorry there's a lot of spaces that um houses that have shared verges aren't there you know in sort of 60s yes. um planning and actually that is really it's the commons essentially isn't it um, so it was about me, what people do in their front garden and actually you're facing your neighbours and you can you can just grab people in the street and chat to them, uh, not literally grab them, um, but also this connected thing and you can see, and I know, and in COVID, obviously looking out at somebody else's front garden mm. was kind of make or break. It, it was everything. I don't think you, I, I, again, this is... I don't think you can underestimate that because I'm not I'm not saying this to self-publicize, but my front garden in Cambridge that I know that brought a lot of people a lot of joy because I used to sit out there just sort of getting out of the house, you know, especially during the first part of the first lockdown. Mm -hmm. And I just remember, you know, people coming up to me saying, I, I do my walk and I specifically come around this part oh. of the estate to see it. And and again, this is. We moved on now and you know covid's sort of over and we kind of forget about it but you know the impact that you know green spaces had on people and horticulture and flowers and nature that can't be underestimated and i know like i say we've moved on and covid's over but the, the legacy of covid i hope this is you know there's mm -hmm. one good legacy that's come out of it that people people's connection to nature their own space is not their private defensible spaces that attitude has changed 
Mm. And Jude's garden, I mean, the, the kind of layout of your road and the mm. fact that you can see, I don't know. So, how many sorry, houses. sorry, guys. So we need yeah. to, right, if you listen to the podcast, pause it. Jude, what's your, um, what's your Instagram handle, please? Oh, good question. Jude Rice. Is it just my name? Jude Rice. Yeah, okay. Just... At Jude Rice. Go on to that. Best front garden. <laughs> I think it's absolutely superb. Yeah. So stop the podcast. Look at it. Get some <laughs> ideas from her front garden. Absolutely superb. Sorry, sorry, sorry to embarrass you, you, but I think it was great. <laughs> it is brilliant. And do you know what? You can see it for miles because mm. there's ha- there's hardly any planting in your street. And actually, when you, if like, so is it like, how many houses is it from your house to the top of like, well, towards Coronation Alley? Yeah, 50 40, houses. 50. 40. So when you're up the top of the street and you look down the slope and, and kind of whoop towards Jude's, you yeah. can see the Eckings. Mm. Like yeah. the echiums are there holding <laughs> the port. It's brilliant. Yeah. Things are just sort of overflowing onto the path. Over. So, so as terms of transformation, yeah. it's been really yeah. dramatic, yeah. hasn't it? Yeah, it has. It's and I think it we sort of benefit as well from the kind of layout because our house is set back from the road a bit. It's kind of original it's like 1830s kitchen garden cottages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of the first little terrace in Oldfield Park where we are. Um, and everything kind of see the maps everything sort of been built around it there was just loads of food growing and horticultural stuff where in between me and Claire there's lots of interesting history and beyond horticultural history yeah yeah lots of horticultural history um yeah and I don't know how it started I was really overwhelmed overwhelmed by the rectangle and (laughs) you know really like straight lines and Mm. neatness not in a kind of like too tidy kind of way but just a bit weird obsession with straight lines the pond yeah but the pond was a lot of it was driven by the pond yeah I knew I wanted a pond and I wanted it to be as big as possible (laughs) so it's about a third so how long is it the garden's maybe about 15 meters long and about five or six meters wide Mm. Um, and the pond is about a third of that and (laughs) you yeah it's fun (laughs) when we first dug it I stood in it. I think, like, did I send you a photo? You were there. Like, yeah. Sure, you want it to be that big? <laughs> yes. The whole front, the whole front garden was built around having water and wildness, and it's north east facing, so it's quite tricky with plant. Like the plants, I knew I wanted that were kind of long season flowering. You know, that traditionally like sunny stuff. Remember mm. when we were planting? We were kind of tricking all the plants. We planted a big handful of. We were like, are you sure this is going to work? But like planting handfuls of gravel underneath all the things that have gone in. Yeah. And then mm. all the teasels and, yeah, you know, all the ground covery things have kind of muscled their way in and settled, mm. settled and protected the soil. Um, but it's just amazing to see it's, what is it? It's a year, it will be two years old in March, the front garden. And wow. the amount of species that are in there, the mm-hmm. kind of, we would have conversations in the mm-hmm. summer about, you know, I've got an emperor dragonfly today. Have you seen one? <laughs> or what's here? Like the sparrowhawk visits, you know, once a month from what I see, but I'm kind of working full time, not at home. So I don't observe what visits as much anymore. Mm. But it's just, you know, with neighbours who are very tidy neighbours oh. who hoover up the leaves and oh. mow their grass to within mm. an inch of it. You know, it's not I was trying to describe it to someone the other day. It's not really a garden. It's completely static. You know, the clematis. It's a room. It's a room. It's a room. The clematis, oh. clematis, clematis. It's it's <laughs> filled this one space on a trellis on the fence, and it's the same every year. And the you mm. know, anyway. So but, they. But, we but it's what can be. Them. But it's what can be achieved. You know, like I say, it's not a. You know, it's not a a small front garden, but it's not a massive space. But what what yeah, one yeah. can do, you know. What one can do in a space, you know, you can put a pond in there, you can have your echiums, you're going to do all of this and mm. and it is achievable. And it's yeah. and it's only your it's only one's lack of imagination or lack mm. of or that voice inside, you yeah, know, yeah. your head to say, well, I can't do it. I can't do it. We had a we got I, I can't landscape and we didn't have we were both my partner and I working full time. So we've got a friend, um, Tom, who does landscaping. So him and. Mm his guys helped with the kind of hard landscaping and stuff but 
yeah it's just kind of all of the surfaces you know everything's permeable so when we have that heavy rain like the last few mm. days you know yeah. water doesn't sit and the one of the beds is we went to see wild side on dartmoor um you know Keith, Keith Wiley's garden yeah. and yes. just the yes, yes, yes. paths were cut through the soil mm. and so that was really inspiring wasn't it and mm. the way we thought about how gardens you know shouldn't be two-dimensional mm. you know it's not just about the trees but if you can raise the soil and raise where the plants are so I kind of did that mm. a bit it is immersive and I think for me the thing about your garden is that it's um it's very clear that it's you on it's not for you no it's not for humans it's at all. not for humans you have to battle your way through <laughs> Oh, but you yes. just are surrounded by stuff and I think you're so what's what's really interesting is because your your neighbor is a wildlife gardener and she's mm. done a lot of the kind of groundwork and actually it, I mean it's quite it's much more built up than it is here but but actually the bio, there's I think it, there's more biodiversity where Jude is mm. because yeah. your your neighbor has put in that work and yeah, actually yeah. there's particular other things that are cor, you know provide the kind of corridor yeah, we've got the connected, quite a long corridor of mm trees and tall shrubs that are spindly but provide perfect stopping points mm. and so it's more connected the mosaic is working better mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Where you, i mean that's what fascinates us we're really fascinated by these kind of permeable boundaries and oh. we're we're also very interested in you know the limitate well not interest we're frustrated by the limitations of horticulture um and traditional horticultural kind of teachings um so we both did the rhs level two oh my God. and had more <laughs> critical <laughs> thought about it uh, although we, we had did... an, yeah we had an amazing teacher different yeah. times so we both had the same teacher amazing you know really op like uh, you know he has a, he has a critical mind but we i mean i, I kind of went but, into it wanted to know what's being taught and wanted to know what people are being taught yeah. wanted to know what teaching is and why it's not shifting fast enough and why it's not responsive to the climate crisis. I mean, having worked in education recently, um, I wish I could be more diplomatic. I don't think that, you know, I don't yeah. think the, the the qualifications out there are fit for purpose because mm -hmm. like I say, every, you know, the, the, the qualifications are ratified and brought brought into education. And they can't they cut they simply can't move as fast as you know as the situation you know you can go out and do a do a horticultural qualification and part of that horticultural qualification is a pa1 and a pa6 certificate and the the way the qualifications look at invertebrates they looked as pests they're not looked as mm -hmm. part of the ecosystem so so that's my little rant. I don't think it's fit for purpose, yeah. sadly. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I I, I mean, I, that was kind of what we felt that yeah. we thought we'd, you know, find that. Um, and yeah. I guess it's sort of um, so it's <sighs> it's kind of essential for the some of lots of it was interesting. It kind of mm. kick started, I guess, a lot of our conversations about soil, I guess, mm. didn't it? Knowing mm. kind of what the soil needs to you know support a healthy plant and I guess mm. we hadn't really talked much about soil yeah and, and, compost. It, and it also gave us an insight to what other gardeners were thinking and other people who were training them because I you know I thought I'd go into that space and we'd all be thinking about pests in a different way than using the mm. four-letter word pest uh, but actually no so so again it's like you know what damage do gardeners do and how do gardeners need to be educated and so you know who's mm. who, how are people coming <laughs> to gardening yeah. in the first place mm. so being in a room full of people um in all different places is yeah it's, it's really interesting it was helpful in that sense infiltrating yeah. the rhs yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they do need to be infiltrated yeah they're uh a uh, few years behind so uh, let's go back you said something that 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 really just made my heart explode you said impermeable sorry impermeable boundaries what did you say yeah. Permeable, permeable boundaries. So permeable ba boundaries, yes. Hmm. So, so, so that is again. So that is, I guess you mean that in the in the physical sense that, you know, a hedgehog can get from one garden to another, but also, hmm. psychology, psych psychologically speaking, you know, the boundaries between, you know, I'm not going to talk to my neighbour. I don't want to talk hmm. to my neighbour. You know, I, I want to break hmm. down these sort of mental barriers about reaching out to people. Is that is that where you were yeah. coming from? property and ownership mm -hmm. and yeah yeah 
I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because I think, you know, I've, I've seen neighbours of mine take hedges out and it's just made me want to, you know, we have just planted more trees or we've planted more trees. But those trees, I, I think one of the things we talk the most about is if you, you need to understand the life cycle of, of, the, of the creatures that are coming to your garden because you might be able to support one component of that life cycle, but not all of them. So, you know, across the street, a street could support that life cycle. So that idea that I'm feeding your birds or that, mm. you know, your whatever is overwintering in my whatever, I think is really compelling. And actually we, we see our gardens as this sort of jigsaw of habitats yeah. that interlock mm. and that those, those boundaries are crucial. They're really, really crucial because the other thing that is kind of my bugbear is we're such like horizontal gardeners. Anybody mm. who puts something up, you're standing up, is this sort of a revelation this is like i'm going to put something that stands up but as soon as you do that you know from an artistic perspective and the way that the light touches it it's beautiful those light catchers the idea that a plant is a light catcher and mm. you can tell how the light moves around your garden yeah. um and when the first bird lands in the tree that you've planted or aphid mm. or the first aphid yeah. arrives or the first ladybird yes or yes. all of those things that's really really exciting but you've got to look and you've got to stop weeding <laughs> you've got to stop doing the things so you've got time to look at the things and it's connected <laughs> to a big conversation so we co-manage well with some other key volunteers manage a tree nursery and we're talking to people within blooming white way about we've got some fair trees do people want trees and one of the first things a lot this, of people this is say, how it goes right this is how it goes this is how it goes um would you like a, would you like a free tree uh, well, how big is it going to get? And tools <laughs> are available. So it's like every time, how big is it going to get? And oh, you know, yeah. oh, it's got berries. Oh, are they poisonous? <laughs> oh god, uh, it doesn't doesn't change, does it? It's like uh, oh. So we're really, we're, we're, but that's that's so interesting because also the other thing is that people haven't um quite we haven't quite got to that point where you go right. I can have a tree in my garden and also for trees hopefully and if it gets too big i'm going to cut it i'll cut some some of it off and i will use the wood and also when we were reading some stuff about um i think I'm sure it was cape bradbury like we when we were reading some stuff about oak trees maybe mm. it was in wilding or somewhere else mm -hmm. about all the things that need oak trees and oh. i was thinking well, I want an oak tree. I need an oak tree. I haven't got room for one. And then somehow we kind of decided, well, all these trees that we may not have room for as trees, why don't we put them in a hedge? Mm. So we've put between us rowan in rowan and oak and you know all the things in a hedge, just mm. getting plants. I mean, how and they many... can be coppice, and they yeah. can be you know. So we're just it's it's all those ex you know. I think again that comes back to sort of horticultural um training doesn't it you plant a tree and you expect it to become this kind of specimen and you've got to see it you've got to stick with it and let it go through its whole life cycle. it doesn't have to go through its whole life cycle mm. actually you can keep planting keep kind of regenerating but then maybe use that wood chip that wood put it lay it down on the ground you know let it do its kind of breaking down thing use it for other mm. habitat use it you know it's like how do we're really thinking about what what's the inputs inputs into the garden and how do we oh we went down to martin crawford's um oh, forest like, garden forest garden and just like you know we're all stood it's like the, the so where is this sorry i think that's the um, first part Darting, dartington so he's he's kind of quite well renowned globally i guess as a kind of current forest gardener and he's written a few books about different kinds of forest garden trees so nitrogen fixing ones and nut trees and Yes. climbers and um he yeah he's connected to the schumacher college in dartington who have historically done a lot of ecological and environmental mm, yes training. yes yes yeah yeah there's interest really interesting things going on in that um yeah on those sites which so is where i grew up but i didn't <laughs> really have a clue about what was going on around me while i was there yeah it's pretty beautiful mm. yeah so, and he so go on Oh. And and so we so he we went on this kind of uh, workshop day and we ended up standing near a very very big clump of bamboo which he it took him a while to start talking about the bamboo and everybody's thinking there's bamboo here oh my god there's bamboo in the ground, <laughs> in the ground. Um, <laughs> and he's talking about you know how if you, you know you just you just eat the bits you need or you take the bits you need you use the bits yeah. in the garden all of that and not being scared like there's this kind of fear you isn't there you control it by eating, eating it. it you don't have to bury <laughs> 
plastic membrane 16 meters below the soil or yeah you know, choose your species <laughs> wisely eat it no, no. sorry so you can eat sorry I, I sound like a the opposite of a panda here you you can eat bamboo <laughs> sorry yeah oh is it the tips is it what was it the yeah. asparagus esque or yeah you can eat the shoots we yeah. didn't um you have to do something to it don't you do you have Put to enlarge it, it or do something it. but yeah. it's yeah, i mean you know he just it's a delicacy around the world mm. it's yeah, highly, highly nutritional it's yeah. really worth going to sit up see him or or, or just, uh, even visiting the site he just takes you from plant to plant and plants that are really climate tolerant climate res resilient and um very wide range of plants and we talked a lot about about that didn't we yeah and they're not all native so that, yeah we're there's you know there's a lot of conversation going on isn't there about native non-native and he was talking about the trees that he's that he's planting now or that he's grafting now in line with you know kind of where the temperature is kind of moving up the country so so can i again this comes up on every podcast Mm. What is your what's your view? What's your view on the native non-native uh, debate? I guess if you'd call it that, we have to go with the climate. Mm. Say that again, Claire. We have to go with the climate. I think, yeah, I think it's worth repeating. I think that. So, what? Because again, that got? kind of links to the tree nursery. Mm. Is in. I guess you've got to have a mix, haven't you? Because again, you, you've got to be planting for 50 to 100 years into the future. But if I can take a, a case study of tree planting that we did in our village, again, we got some money from, uh, got some funding, which was great. And we planted all non-native. And then again, there's a little part in, in my head saying, yeah, they're all non-native. But if you look at the, tr if you look at the trees that were planted with the estate, which was, Oh, 1970s yeah 1970s so what are they sort of 50 years old you look around the whole estate and they're all struggling they're all had you know the last 10 15 years the incrementally the hot summers and the, the, the extremes of of the of the growing season has really taken their toll and and a lot of them are in decline so it's so i guess i, I guess that we are you know we're planting for the future because 15 20 years time you're going to have the let's give it the broad term the invertebrates that are currently probably i don't know southern france you know they're going to they're going to be they're going to be migrating north or so i understand it mm -hmm. yeah I yeah think from from what i have been reading then um I guess it depends on the plant and what species. If we've got specific species in this country that rely on a native plant, then I would choose to plant it. But I always use the example of the vipers, bugloss, and the echium. You know, if I know that the echium is going to flower for seven months, <laughs> eight months, it's still flowering. And I know that this tiger moth, scarlet tiger moth, who uses the vipers, bugloss, I think that's the right one. Yeah, you know she'll still use the echium, and yeah. there's been tons of them, and it and then it's providing food for all these different bumblebees and all sorts of other bees and, and biomass. The biomass is living in there. It's about <laughs> nine foot mm. tall. But I, yeah, I guess in our country there are a lot less species that rely on individual plants, aren't there? It's kind of like in the states and a lot of other countries mm. where this specific species mm -hmm. have these symbiotic relationships yeah and i think the, the forest garden model which you know i guess what i when i think about it i think well if you get the canopy right then that provides shade and mitigates for other species possibly are we going to be able to protect uh, the native species with non-natives well I just, I, do you know what I mean? yeah i do know what you mean we i was with a friend i was walking around um eltham 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 palace uh so, so, basically it's in london somewhere and we were having this debate as well where we were thinking again i don't like these you know, i don't like these terms but ecological services like you know it's all well mm -hmm. you know if you have a whole oak as a you know as a sort of a, a grand example with its wide canopy and the climate you know mitigation where you are sort of you know where underneath you've got 
you know, an air temperature and a soil temperature that's 10 degrees below that can actually support X, Y, and Z uh, plant species and other, sp and other you know, fauna, mm -hmm. that's, that's not a bad thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and when we went to see Martin Crawford, the I mean, he'd, he'd only just started. It was it was it after the first heat event. It was very it was in July, wasn't it? Mm. So everybody else was really you know watering like hell, and he'd only just about started watering. And he had <laughs> the way that he was collecting the water. He had a four acre site, and he was taking every bit of water, and and um, it, it was kind of working its way up the field. <laughs> Solar to, pumping it up so, to a half a million liter water reservoir amazing and, wow. and and he was and he was playing a lot with how plants protected each other against drought so he was working with grasses and he was working kind of with plant communities mm. he's doing loads i mean it's well, really, there, was there we go i mean I, I, you say the word that sprung to mind plant communities you know getting back mm. getting back to looking at plants in communities rather than individual specimens mm. or looking at plants you know or arranging plants in a way you know the old uh, old-fashioned style where you're taking one plant from the azores another plant from you know china at, at you know a thousand uh, thousand meters above sea level you know all this artificial aesthetic i, I don't know it's just, um perhaps that's not that's not really sustainable and it is just getting back to communities. Mm. And he talks a lot about the different, the different ways he established different parts of his forest garden. So some were kind of no dig style, weren't they? Mm. Like cardboard and wood chip, others where he'd let the grass grow, but he planted nurse trees. So like yeah. silver birches or in another part, there were like pioneer plants, which was a type of um uh, a gorse related gorse, thing yeah. so like a nitrogen fixing plant mm. and then you know, with the knowledge that they would then be cut they provide a lot of things mm. you know but they'd run their life yeah they'd run their yeah and they're kind they... of serving a purpose mm. and then yeah just amazing you know kind of complexity but really in really really fascinating mm. it, was, it was really it's interesting ama amazing but those old skills and the the ability to watch how plants grow and support each other in the landscape in the wild landscape that kind of it is amazing but we've kind of we're kind of relearning all this stuff aren't we yeah but we're learning it we're learning it with new knowledge aren't we because i think that's, i'll have these conversations with my dad you know he's he's nearly 80 and he's grown up you know he could he could name the wildflowers when he was 10 he's be, he's immersed in that he really is I, I said to him the other day you know how do you feel about the plants dad and he's like oh they're my friends Aww. um so it was really interesting I said to my mum how do you feel about the plant I really wanted to get to this and she said I love them all and it's like so this idea that that they're so connected to them and he's but he's in the middle of that you know knowing the wildflowers and then working on the you know grow, growing for market mm -hmm. um, as a salad producer with high you know high chem chemical inputs and all of that which was kind of the backdrop to my childhood I probably didn't notice the men in suits coming to blast the <laughs> native out of the greenhouse but they were there um, and I remember, I do remember my dad putting on his PPE and walking around and spraying everything, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he's come out the other side and we have loads of conversations now and we talk about a lot about ecological gardening and he came in the summer and he said it's so weird to go into a garden that doesn't, that isn't a light, that isn't buzzy. Mm. He said, you know, because he sees, he sees a lot of gardens, he talks to a lot, of, like everybody in his village comes and talks to him because he can just, da, 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 there you go, that's what you need to do. Yeah. So that's the curiosity. Um, but yeah. Yes, so it feels like this is kind of divide now, isn't there, between the gar people who understand and can see the worth in gardening for climate breakdown and the people who are holding on to their lawns <laughs> and holding on for dear life, you know. So what I want to get on to is, yes, people do want to hold on to their lawns. Yeah. But I think what people, there is, there is part of it that people don't know what they don't know. And I think yeah. is part of your role part of your role is you know you talk you've talked about doing the rhs i get that but it's part of your role is to to educate people that you come in contact with you know within within all the stuff that you do like i say people don't know what they don't know and if you told them that plant this um echium or plant this uh, or plant a range of spring flowering bulbs and then plant some, you know, uh, native geranium and then have a, 
euonymus or whatever it may be that they could attract more wildlife to the garden and, and they're just blissfully ignorant of it so it's part of your role really just education 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 i think it's awe and kind of delight i think that education i think i don't know i kind of have a bit of a problem with that word in a um it, it kind of feels hierarchical doesn't it and it and i yes. think i mean we if you get us we could just get so excited mm. about stuff and i was back going back to that kind of specificity like one of the early pro things we did sessions we did was with the teasels yeah teasels, teasels, teasels. and goldfinches <laughs> So we had so we had a, a kind of making activity, which was about making a goldfinch out of card and then um, decorating it and decorating it and putting it on a on a straw and then making it so it's stuck in um, a pot, which we offered a kind of potting on um, activity. So there was that hands in the soil and ha and a kind of crafting thing that came together. And then we could talk about how the tea, the the goldfinch has and a especially a male goldfinch especially adapted beak mm. yeah and, and then all the things you visit <laughs> I mean, there were, it was interesting because we were at the festival of nature wasn't it mm. and yeah just different really interesting audience of tidy gardeners and people who were growing very traditional cottage garden plants and we were kind of questioning you know why a teasel only should mm. live on a verge or a motorway roundabout and why <laughs> you know how beautifully architectural they look and don't you want to see more birds in your garden and <laughs> You know all the things that come and visit and drink and eat from it and i think people could really just see mm. from our like childlike so yeah, yeah. excitement oh, at this, this plant bomb. that attracts all the things yeah i so, still like that so, so it's like so you know I, I i agree with what you say about it's quite hierarchical we're, we're, we're educating you but mm. i guess by osmosis you are sort of people pick up on the passion mm -hmm. and the love and then that becomes more more infectious for people yeah, mm -hmm. I think, I guess, like, it's made me think about with my neighbours. I can't imagine my neighbour's response if I <laughs> suggested that he left the fallen tree leaves on his border, <laughs> you know, what that might do to this, like, how it might help. And, and they're getting on a bit and mm -hmm. it would probably result in much less work for them, you know, doing all, but, but they're kind of those of the control and order and that's just I guess that's how they've always gardened I think we accept that some people you can't you can't change everybody some people are really receptive some people are on the verge and one one person who joined our front garden festival this year which was a really really like lovely story was um somebody who revamped their front garden and because we called it gardens alive and we made it really clear that it was a garden you know it's kind of front garden festival with a focus on wildlife um she actually went and researched which plants and she's wanted to do she's wanted to garden for mm. years so she's had a space but she's and she's always watched the gardening programs but she had time in covid and you know some some of the kind of resources to do it and um so it, she went oh wildlife gardening okay let me think about what that means and she did her own research and she went and bought the plants and did the things and she put, put in a small pond, pond in, yeah. put a little pond in on a patio uh -huh. um and it did you know it kind of uh, it, in many ways it's quite a traditional garden but everything and we, we with the judges we spent a lot of time talking about the garden going no but wait a minute look what she's done here yeah. and we actually had time to uh, have a brilliant conversation with her and she told us how it's you know how she went through that process and, and she said that's because you said it was wildlife and she'd gone off and shared her her kind of thoughts and her um, skills that she gained with another of her networks. So, um, and I guess, and she, I think also she was kind of like, oh, I kind of wish I knew about this sooner because I've spent money and I might not have needed to spend money. Um, yeah. I actually could have had a garden that was abundant. Cause I think we talk a lot about, you know, when people go, oh, there's all the, there's all the, the like, like the, the aphids. It's like, but that's abundance, like yes. abundance. Yes. Like we that don't draws the birds in. We it's don't, not your bird feeder, it's the aphids. So we don't have abundance. That's where that 97% is gone. And that, you know, it's like we can't imagine what that what that is. And and we one of the things that we used to be well into the new perennial movement, um, <laughs> big on grasses and or, ornamental grasses. Yeah. And then, you know, we go to Bruta, go to look at the Pete Udolf place at Hauser and Worth and been to the talks, da 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 da. Lovely, lovely, lovely. But we're also like wait a minute but who's visiting like who's like we're asking each other like, who's visiting anything I get I went back this time it was yeah it was my birthday this time mm. last year and it was you know beautiful obviously because it's Pete Udolf but mm. 
the seed heads and there were some asters and some things still in flower and the hedgerows still had berries on them and things but you know apart from a rat that we saw <laughs> that we took joy in watching <laughs> scurrying along you know the soil was bare and mm. there was you know we couldn't see life there mm. were birds in the hedgerows and there were birds flying over mm. but I think though we perhaps needed um we've needed Pierre Aldoff. We've needed to sort of go through that process because mm -hmm. I agree that if you you know, I've been to the same garden. I was actually I was actually in that garden with Pierre when it opened a few a, mm -hmm. a few years ago. Not to sort of name drop, but I am mm -hmm. name dropping. But um, but yeah, you yeah, the only people visiting it were very, very rich very rich people that could spend 150 pound a ticket so those, those are the people visiting the garden but um but yeah not, not a lot of wildlife mm. but, but you're I think... right I mean that's the place that started our conversation into yeah. the long live perennials and the kind of way you can the weave them together yeah, yeah the winter leaving things standing that kind of yeah, is where that's the conversation the function. began yeah isn't it, definitely really? the function it served yeah and yeah you know I, matrix planting all you know kind of I guess trying to do that in my garden and then thinking oh, it's not it's just not working I might you know yeah. what does that mean about the way that I garden but then if you look at I mean I know we're all big fans of John Little but if you kind of yeah. you know if you kind of look at um, I was talking to John a couple of months ago and if you kind of look at that style of you know perennial movement it's still quite high maintenance it's still you know you're doing stuff to the soil you're adding loads of compost and you're you know Ooh. you've got to actively maintain it and then I think that I don't think it was a conscious effort by John, but you know now the sort of I guess the zeitgeist has moved on to that sort of looking at reducing maintenance, looking at the soil as well, looking at soil as a substrate, not just as high productive organic, you know, rich in organic matter. So I think I think the perennial movements played its part, but I think we now need to move beyond mm -hmm. pure aesthetic and. Mm -hmm. And we well, heaven forbid function. How about that? And, Bye -bye. And, I think, and I think also applying to so a lot of what I do is growing food. And I guess we're talking a lot about the ornamental stuff and the mm -hmm. plants for, you know, than other than non-human, you know, things. But we need to apply the same rules for food growing. Yes. And yeah. this is urgent. Gardens, yeah. You know, we've got some good models here, kind of middle ground growers and some other really yeah. good. Oh, can you can you can you talk about that, please, 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 yes, please? Yeah. Because that again really fascinated to hear more about that, please. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's just some extremely passionate and knowledgeable 20 somethings mm -hmm. got together, you know, they've been doing a lot of reading and learning and got together and were able to put all their life savings into buying a piece of land. Having, having kind of set up a small version of a market garden and fed, I can't remember the numbers, but a certain amount of families mm. growing in an ecological way, um, you know, always covering the soil, kind of minimal inputs, wood, using wood chip, using chickens, I think, and um, moving stuff around via an electric bike, solar to kind of charge the minimal tools they have. Um, but they, yeah, did a huge kind of crowdfund, didn't they? And mm -hmm. loads of amazing publicity. And they, yeah, if you kind of listen to any of the podcasts that any of them have been on, um, yeah, you can hear the kind of passion. Mm. And yeah, it's a 15 acre plot on the other side of town, um, on the hillside that they're mm. setting up a sort of agroforestry style mm. um, garden. And they've already started feeding families. So I, I get one of their veg bags. So they, drop them off at different locations around town so it's super easy from people all over town to collect them mm. uh, and mm. it's yeah seasonal food that's got in you know occasionally there's a little snail there's soil on things you know <laughs> oh my it's God. Well, how, how will we survive with a, a, bit of, a bit of soil on our on our food and our, or a disfigured <laughs> carrot yeah and they yeah just yeah I but it's think, radical for yeah, the city it's, it's really radical it's for this very conservative historically conservative city and they're really up against it with yeah issues on planning because the sort of growing landscape not just here is we'd rather see a monoculture field than we would a polytunnel mm. Mm. 
Bath's very, I mean, it's, you know, kind of the opposite from Cambridge, like wherever you are, you can see the other side of the city and there's a lot about who can see which views and all of that. Mm. Um, okay. So we have, I, I, I think part of the thing that our community work has done and Blooming White Way has allowed us to do is to just get ourselves into conversations. And yeah. I think this is, this is another massive, massive thing. Um, and we do it on all fronts anything to do with the green or growing or you know ecological or whatever you know all to, you know we just try to get ourselves connected with as many people as we can and talk to people I mean that one of the you know at sort of local authority level um council level we, you know we work with Avon Wildlife Trust who have supported us and been brilliant since the start we work with Bathscape who are a kind of um, kind of mishmash of different um, organisations in that? Yeah, it's kind of a uh, it's got a kind of finite life basket, mm. but they've also but supported to get people out onto into the city to mm. learn about the all of the basket. So on green spaces, specific mm. kind of historical, ecological, or geological <laughs> like yeah. pockets of knowledge all around the. Yeah, because because the, the irony is that we're a UNESCO World Heritage whatever it is city. Okay. So there's a lot, obviously we have a lot of tour tourists who come because of that um, accreditation, whatever it is, but we're also illegally polluted. So the, bowl, yeah, yeah. So the bowl shape of Bath just holds all that pollution. We have a big, a massive traffic problem. Um, and, you know, again, there's this kind of little skit, you know, you say to somebody, oh, you know, I live in Bath, lovely, oh, that's lovely. Mm, beautiful city. Beautiful city. And in many ways, <laughs> obviously it is, you know, uh, mm. there's lots to say about where the money came from uh that, that built bath and you know bristol similar um but and, and cambridge and, and cambridge is unfortunately well, exactly. yeah so you've got these you know you've got this kind of green edge city and and the edge is really protected but if you go down into the middle of the city it's very very hard the surface is very there's very little green I mean there's kind of there's a park and a massive another massive park but actually those connected spaces and we're always telling the story about how our, how our um, estate connects the open countryside because we are one road away from open countryside to the city farm that's below us and to the city at large mm. so we're like this place to seed biodiversity and we're, I find that again that's a really compelling story it fits really beautifully with Bath's kind of yeah. geography you know and you can imagine that it's very easy to imagine the bird's eye view of flying because you know if the, the sparrowhawk visit is, visits Jude or the red kite if she says the red kite's over my house it might be over mine and there's other friends I do that you know we can we yeah. know the flight of the peregrines from the from Mamba Street down near the city centre to you know where they you know I've got a, a, somebody who lives over that way who's like I see the peregrine because of the, the, the just the geography of the city it really lends itself to the bird life it's beautiful mm. for that mm. you know you just want to do con kind of continual drone shots yeah and <laughs> it's so well connected here and because the way that countryside is farmed mm. there is in that very traditional way. So all the things are looking to here yes. and further into the city. Yeah. We've got nowhere else to go. Yeah. So we that we our, our hunch is that there's greater biodiversity in pockets across the city than there is surrounding it. Um yes. which is one of the reasons why we have this map, because we've been picking up all of loads of different conversations at various events we've done over the years. Mm. And you know, someone down there has had a sparrow hawk kill a pigeon in their front garden or loads of people have found hedgehogs or foxes or badgers or, or deer deer slow worms yeah, yeah. Mm. We've got a massive population of slow worms and yeah so there's there's so much here and we i, I go on dan <laughs> no i've just so so it's really interesting so the the, the so the collaboration part and, and the, the the conversations you have again i so it's a very leading question because I want people to listen to this to sort of get sort of inspiration for their own sort of community projects. I mean, how do you find on a sort of day to day, well, not day to day basis, but when you you meet people and you're collaborating with, you know, different groups, different organisations? I mean, how do you find that? You know, do you, is it is it a case of you know you've got to find out what they want and so they can they can win and they can get what they want and then you can get what you want or I mean how does we're it very, kind of work I think we're getting better at being very clear about what we think we want because we don't yeah. need any money like I mean we could that because of where we where Whiteway sits and uh, because we're kind of um 
you know, kind of the indices of deprivation, et cetera, et cetera. We, we could access a lot of funding, but I mean, we don't, we, we're very resourceful. We're very, we don't we really need people yeah. for things. It's much more valuable for us to have a, a we over propagate. So we've got free plants to give away. My dad propagates, other people propagate for us. So, let, got, so let me ask you the question then. Yeah. So is it a case of, uh, you don't, you don't, and you don't have to answer this. You don't want to get funding because you don't want to be, semi beholden to other people's Ooh. outcomes is that we've had we've had a few pots of funding yeah. and i think they've been really interesting for us in you know forcing us to learn things about certain plants or species that we may not have otherwise and and how to navigate these kind of funding systems and putting in the bids and how you know you have to be have very specific skills which fortunately we have um to access those kind of things but then all of the so in my last job I worked in an impact and evaluation for another charity and you kind of you know that was what I did for my job but the doing it doing it reflecting on our project working with real people in real neighborhoods you know with kind of real life stuff going on is mm. it's really difficult mm. to, when you're asked about how many numbers how many people you know it's not just about the people it's about the species I think it's yeah. difficult it's really difficult it's helped us maybe getting our foot in the doors for certain conversations because we've done certain things and got certain mm. lots of funding. Perhaps. Yeah, we have had some dalliances with Bath in Bloom. <laughs> I don't know if this is the platform to talk about that, but we're not, you know, we're not, I don't know. I think we, and we had money from Q. So we did, we, we had, we had quite a bit of money from Q and, you know, we ran a, yeah, we ran a really good project. Um, it feels like because of the urgency and the emergencies mm -hmm. that maybe more pockets of money are presenting themselves that have less strings attached mm. and those are the kind of bits of money that people mm. like us need to actually just get we, some stuff done yeah but we're more interested in good collaborators yeah. i think that's yeah. the thing if, if 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 we can work um with like we are you know we've got connections with the with the parks department we've got connections with nurseries um, we've got connect, you know, we 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 steward this nursery for more trees banes, which is um um this amazing project, and that and the group of people around that project are just fantastic. It's mm. there's so much goodwill in that organisation, and that's a very simple thing. We go, we tend to the we tend to the trees and the treelings, and we look after this beautiful site that is, you know, there's we were there on on Saturday, weren't we? and there's jays flying left right and center with oh. acorns in their mouths and there's you know it's just it's just this kind of glorious spot um that's a really easy one um but i can't yeah a tree care is another thing like mm. when the trees are planted but i guess what we do is we advocate for this space because because i feel very strongly that the estate that i live on is kind of out of many of the conversations it's oh. not um it's not central bath um it's you not know even named on the net on the map <laughs> Yeah, so it's kind of this kind of place that people don't necessarily come to mm. unless they know people. So it's, you know, it's been really interesting um, moving here. But our story is that there's loads of nature here. There's loads mm. to talk about. And again, that's back to that storytelling and saying that teasels were grown in fields close to here because the teasels were used to condition the cloth in the mills that were down the hill. Yes, 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 yeah. You've got that specificity, which is, you know, that's what ecology is all about, isn't it? We don't, you know, we have to get over this. It's simple. It's not kind of homogenized. It's it's really about like where we each of us lives is special. And also the thing that fascinates us is urban ecology. Like so, we, so yeah, we have this hunch that there's more biodiversity here, and, and that ecology is layered over whatever the ecology was mm. here to, <laughs> to begin with. Um, but like we I guess the thing that we always talk about doing, which we never quite managed to do effectively, is actually gather that baseline data. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, you know, and that mean would be working in a very systematic way. Yeah. And that's time and that's meeting the experts, uh, having expertise. So I guess there's, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's, there is, well, you probably are aware of it, that there is data out there on with local biological records, but mm. uh, though i think a large proportion of that is from citizen science as in people using apps or you know the plethora of apps out there and that goes into central databases so that can yeah. provide some i mean uh, some data to a certain extent but i guess there's probably no substitute for 
an Looking. ecologist yeah. being on site minute one day one and then mm. going from there yeah yeah you asked an interesting question earlier like what does it what does it feel like day to day I guess because we're in different so you know I'm at work at work and I'm, I'm teaching visual arts students as soon as possible I get to talk I want to talk about ecology with them mm. <clears throat> I'm very interested in who who is already attuned to that yes. um, and I guess in every you know uh, uh, you know and you get them outside at yeah. every possible opportunity <laughs> don't you because there's so much here mm. this you know this side where the campus is to see yeah. and to talk about so I'm and, I, and I'm talking to colleagues in the university and kind of trying to find connections in the university of people who actually get that connection between the more than human world and the creative world and what are the role of artists, how artists can be useful. So I'm always trying to find those people. Um, yes. with this, and there's some really exciting things happening in that. Um, and we so can't I'm, stop. We can't stop talking. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking, you know, it's all about continually talking about the stuff, continually getting the message yeah. out there. Cont I mean, Language so again, I don't want to self-publicize, but again, this is, you know, one of the big things of the podcast, you know, consistently getting that message out there, you know, changing people's view on gardening, ecology, what you can do in a garden, you know, meeting up with like minded people. And just because I do think this is. I do feel that, you know, legislation has got to change, but we can't we can't at all. Well the last two weeks has shown us we can't wait for them to change so this grassroots uh grassroots movement where people take 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 this by the scruff of their neck to change what we can change within our power it's just there's no other way where it's going to change is it really no like, and we think yeah i and i think this thing about looking at one of the things we do a lot is look around at what other activities going on and there's there's two reasons for that and one is to learn from other people yes. and the other thing is we're looking for hope and we're looking for action yeah. and you know it it kind of gives us solace to go oh my gosh there's a there's a group in so and so who are doing this that's amazing like when nobody's in like we're all trying to work together and connect and you yes. know we're all working towards the same goal yes. 